Well, hey, we're going to have a uh, short uh, lecture, if it's okay with you, from my home office. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the topic this week, but in, in broader terms, if it's okay. Uh, the first topic in the discussion board this week is about juvenile offenders. Uh, but I want to think about it in broader terms, like I said. I'm, I'm working on a new class for Southern New Hampshire University, which is a class about uh, just basically juveniles and families in the law. So, you, you know, when you take a juvenile, <clears throat> whenever I was in juvenile court, it never failed, but when you had a juvenile in court, you had the whole family in court. In fact, you usually had the preacher, the grandma, the mother, uh, oftentimes the father who was at odds with the mother, uh, grandparents, uh, aunts, uncles, uh, and so forth, extended relatives. And so it made it uh, even uh, more uh, fraught with uh, different uh, complexities and dimensions and so forth. And, and really, truthfully, uh, working in juvenile court for the many years that I did, I mean, there's a lot more to juvenile court than meets the eye. It's not just the delinquency cases. You have child abuse cases, you have child neglect cases, you have runaway cases, you have um, young girls that are angry at their dad because they won't let them wear makeup, you have uh, young girls that are angry at their dad because their dad's been having sex with them since they were eight years old. I mean, it's a wide range of, of problems. Uh, in addition, you have paternity cases where you're trying to force the parents to take responsibility for their children. You have uh, cases where uh, one girl has sex with four or five different guys and is not sure which of the guys because she had sex all at the same time. She's not sure which one is the father of her child. Uh, you have cases where the parents are so bad and you've worked and worked with them and tried and tried and finally reached the conclusion that their parental rights have to be terminated and the children need to be adopted out to a different family. So it's just a wide, wide range of uh, issues in juvenile court. And so um, as far as the punishment of a juvenile and so forth, uh, there's just a lot more involved here than uh, the standard adult. Well, adults are responsible for their actions. They need to take responsibility uh, and be punished for what they did. I mean, it's a kind of a standard view of most adult people. Uh, with juveniles, though, there can be just so many things. I mean, of course, uh, lack of development. You have children who are stunted uh, as far as their mental ability, their mental development. Uh, you have a lot of emotional issues. You have children who are abused. One of the big things that, that we often talk about with juvenile offenders is this whole concept of is, is it nature or is it nurture? Which is it? Which is the thing that's the biggest, most compelling factor uh, in these cases. Nature means, are these children born bad? Are they born into bad families? And they're uh, more or less if genetically just doing what comes naturally in terms of what their whole family's done for hundreds of years. There are cases like that where children one after another are born into a bad family and um, become thieves and robbers and crooks and criminals and murderers, you know. Uh, there are other situations where people argue, well, what if they were separated from their family at a young age and adopted out by another family? Wouldn't they do better? Uh, which would mean that it's nurture, it's not nature. So the environment is more important than their genes. Uh, and so they've had some cases. The problem is that the numbers, when you look at these juvenile cases, are so small uh, in terms of twin studies that it's hard to get an accurate a uh, solid uh, uh, study based upon the few people that they're able to locate, maybe 200. Well, the 200 in the context of millions and billions of people is not a very good standard in terms of trying to decide, you know, is this a valid study, you know, uh, is this study reliable, you know. And so there have been some of these studies and it's kind of interesting. Uh, twins are separated. One child goes to a minister's family. Another child goes to a mechanic's family. Both start with M. I don't know why I picked them. But, uh, and, you know, it's interesting that they, many of them have turned out exactly the same, regardless of who their parents were. Um, you know, it's, it, it's difficult to say, though, because, once again, the studies are so small 
that it's it's tough to say well we've got the answer right here that's not necessarily the the, the whole answer so that's just uh, just one way that it's been approached but it let us at least say that we know the two big influences on juvenile uh, crime and juvenile delinquency is nature which is to say their physical setup of their body and nurture which is how they're raised and you can look at it like this let's say that a child is born with a brain deficiency there's something wrong in their brain that makes them uh, violent and angry and uh, want to get even with people all the time uh, stubborn to a point of it, it being like a bad thing uh, let's say that a child is born uh, with no uh, conscience like a sociopath or even worse a psychopath a serial killer for example uh, let's say that another child is um, beaten in the head from the time the child is brand new brand new baby up until he's six seven years old until he's able to get his hands on a gun and kill his father who's been beating him about the head and shoulders his whole life well the injury to a brain in an environment like that can be just as adverse to the personality of a person as being born with mental deficiency or mental uh, or brain damage uh, so sometimes the people argue well who cares is it nature is it nurture it doesn't really matter that much but we know that both nature which is to say our physical body can be flawed at birth or nurture our physical body can be harmed in our environment either uh, psychologically or physically to the point where we react in an adverse way we become a criminal uh, but these are um, you know just two of the examples there's a third example where that child has everything given to them uh, their life is they have the life of Riley it's perfect in every way and yet they still turn out bad you know how can that happen uh, we talked earlier about ministers kids you know my family uh, there's ministers in my family uh, and there's a, a common expression among ministers called PKs which is preachers kids and preachers kids generally speaking have a very bad reputation now it's funny because most of them turn out just great but when they're growing up they're into trouble all the time and so, uh, you know, uh, what about these kids that have life more or less given to them? They have everything they need, and yet they still turn to a life of crime. Uh, they cannot handle celebrity. They cannot handle the money. Uh, they're into substance abuse, alcoholism, cocaine, drugs, all kind of things. And they commit crimes against other people. Uh, there's many, many stories of kings, dukes, great leaders throughout time who were serial killers because they just liked to kill people uh, you know some people like to hunt deer and some people like to hunt people you know uh, and so you know how can this how can this happen so some of it defies scientific explanation uh, but some of it, it you know can it at least be worthy uh, of exploring and trying to consider and so forth uh, let's turn our attention a little bit to the history of the juvenile court system because in about uh, the early 20th century Chicago was one of the first places to come up with this concept of a juvenile court and until that time juveniles had been treated the same as anybody else subject to a life of uh, misery in prison with adult prisoners oftentimes killed oftentimes uh, maimed oftentimes sexually abused or they could be sold into servitude. Many children were sold to be sailors on sailing ships, uh, cabin boys, as it were. And again, those children are subject to a terrible life, oftentimes. Uh, again, subjected to sexual abuse uh, and uh, lots of uh, adversity on the open seas and this type of thing. Others rise. Uh, to the level of being great uh, ship captains and this type thing and have a great life uh, but the, because they're persistent they work hard they they fight their way to the top so this idea of slavery as a, a punishment for juvenile delinquency very common in the 19th and earlier centuries the other thing is that uh, parental abuse was also very common child didn't uh, plow that road just right and you could kill them 
nothing would be said about it. Um, and so in modern times, since the uh, beginning of the 20th century, we've tried to do other things where we've tried to work with children. And I want to tell you this, I've worked in juvenile court for uh, well on to 30 years, okay? Start out in probation, then I became a public defender, then a juvenile referee, and then back as a uh, civilian attorney, private paid attorney for people, oftentimes single pay type, uh, public defender cases and, and other types of appointments. But I will say this about it, and that is that uh, in all that time, I want to say that most of the juvenile delinquents that I saw, most, the vast majority, let's say over 80%, turned out great. You know, law-abiding citizens, wonderful, good people, you know, all these type of things. Uh, and so there was this view in the middle 80s, uh, the time when I was right at the height of my career, where they said, well, there's these super predator juveniles, we've got to do something, we've got to stop this. Well, I, frankly, I just never saw that. I didn't believe it. Uh, and it's proven out over time that, that I was right, that there really were not these super predator juveniles. There were some cases were there people that were bad to the core right from the beginning. There was no hope for them. There was nothing you could do for them. And so, um, you know, it's just the way that it was. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but those were very rare. I want to make a point of saying that that was a very rare thing. Well, as a knee-jerk reaction to this whole thing about super predator juveniles, Florida completely turned their whole juvenile justice system on its head. And they started giving, instead of giving the judge the authority to decide what cases should be tried in juvenile court after hearing, um, the prosecutor could try it uh, without a, a, a hearing. The, the prosecutor could take a juvenile's case to adult court, just file it there uh, for a felony at his choice, not because there was any uh, hearing where a child or a child's advocate could bring forth any evidence in a child's behalf. Uh, it was just a decision the prosecutor made. And the outcome of that after about 20 years has been that it was a very bad mistake. It was a very poor idea. Really, children that needed punishment didn't get as much punishment in the adult system that they actually got in the juvenile system. Some juveniles that were put in the adult system were ruined for life because of an arrogant prosecutor that wanted to make a name for himself. Using lives of children to feather his own nest, make himself, you know, move from prosecutor to judge or be able to say, look folks, I put all these juveniles in adult prison, I'm, I'm fighting crime, you know, when it, actually what he's doing is he's creating criminals, you know. So um, one of my biggest things that I really hate is people that try to use uh, offenders and, you know, basically poor people as a means for their political ends. In other words, they get political uh, appointments or political uh, stardom, as it were, for uh, taking advantage of poor people uh, who are down on their luck, that get in a little bit of trouble, and the next thing you know, they're, they're making a mountain out of a molehill. Uh, and that happened all too often in Florida, and I think that there are many studies that, that prove this. But all in all, and this is the words that I use for you in every kind of case, whether it's adult, juvenile, whatever, we have to maintain our objectivity and try to take each case individually and look at each case piece by piece and make a well-considered decision uh, based on all the facts at hand that we can know at the time. And it's more important to know about real evidence like DNA, if we can get that, than it is about the opinions of people or even eyewitness testimony where they, well, I think I saw him, you know, well, that doesn't help us very much. Uh, eyewitnesses can testify incorrectly for many, many, many reasons. So, with all this in mind, um, you know, I think we should maintain a juvenile system. I think that juveniles should be kept apart from adults. Uh, in most, most cases, very few should be tried as adults. The ones that are tried as adults must be extremely heinous, probably a long history of juvenile delinquency. Uh, leading to a very serious uh, final offense that actually lands them in adult court. That's my take on it. Glad to hear from you in the discussion boards as we go along. Thanks for watching. Uh, let me know if I can answer any questions that you may have.
Thanks again.